It's no secret that the COVID pandemic wreaked havoc in the air transport industry, and significant parts of the global airline network are still dealing with the fallout. It's all too evident from the balance sheets of airlines and aircraft manufacturers and also support companies working behind them. But the devil is in the detail. And for the detail, you need accurate data. That's where data analyst Spire Aviation is contributing, collecting vast amounts of detail on airline operations worldwide and helping customers throughout the sector to make sense of what it's telling us. The data comes from the company's own constellation of more than 110 satellites, each the size of a wine bottle. The Spire team uses technology such as artificial intelligence and machine learning to process everything that these satellites collect. Spire provided AIN with data tracking airliners operated by several major carriers between January 2020, when hardly anyone was even aware of COVID, and the end of May 2021, when the world was all too well aware. The data showed flight activity for carriers such as United, Air China, Lufthansa, Air New Zealand, Singapore Airlines, Qatar Airways, and Southwest Airlines. It also revealed variations and changes in the usage of wide-body airliners such as the Boeing 747, the 777, and the Airbus A380 and the A350. The fluctuations seen in flight activity levels provide clues as to how exactly COVID has impacted air transport. The long-term impact is still yet to be known, right? COVID is still uh, impacting us around the globe in different ways. I think there's two components here on the long-term impact. One is vaccination consistency and pandemic consistency around the world. And two is the future of work. So on the vaccine consistency around the world, the U.S. right now is in a great spot as far as vaccinations. Israel, we thought, was in a great spot in vaccinations, but even they have their own outbreaks right now which when these things happen, we're gonna see travel restrictions, we're gonna see testing requirements, we're gonna see quarantine requirements. And so the pandemic is still playing its, its way out around the world. And the beautiful thing and the challenging thing about the aviation industry is that it connects parts of the world. So you are not immune. You're not immune to the challenges that COVID is wreaking in other people's countries. And then the second thing is, and it's gonna be, it's gonna resonate a lot today, the future of work. Um, we've learned to depend on, uh, on Zoom. And so many more business interactions are happening in that capacity that we'll see. A lot of companies are talking about return to office. If I want to visit a customer today, I can't knock on their door of their apartment. If they're not in the office, I'm not going to go to their city to, to visit with them. And so we'll see how that, uh, that plays out. The data clearly shows that the air transportation system has performed differently in various regions of the world and that airlines have had to take a different approach to deploying their aircraft and in some cases grounding them and putting expansion plans on hold. This is the, the official industry term. It costs a ton to keep an aircraft on the ground. Nobody likes it on their balance sheet not generating revenue. But if you can't count on consistent passenger volumes or you have different expectations for passenger volumes, you're going to try to get it off your balance sheet. You're going to try to change your leasing arrangements. You're going to try to not accept delivery of these aircraft. And so as far as the composition of airline fleets, I think they're looking at it really carefully where it's less about optimizing the marginal cost and much more of looking at your utilization of your fixed costs and how you can sp spread that over you know, on a per passenger, per hour flight basis. So I think we're going to have certain airlines that look at their strategy as a fleet strategy. How do I operate most efficiently on a marginal cost basis, as well as how do I reduce the overhead on my balance sheet? It would be great if every flight had a choice of three different aircraft that based on the number of bookings that day, you operate only the best one. That would be great. The amount of fixed cost overhead for that uh, is, is, uh, prevents that substantially. So we think that switching to that level of, of somewhat of a mixed fleet strategy is both a necessity and a strategic move. It's necessity driven by COVID downturns and the changes in the routes and what's required to operate. Um, and the, but the economics of like A380, for example, flying during these times, just don't, if you can't get the passengers on there, 
you can't operate them. And twin engine aircraft, I think, are kind of the robust workhorses that we're going to see more of. I think what we're seeing is the U.S. and China have really large domestic markets, regional carriers. They've recovered faster than than other regions like Europe. Uh, For example, we're seeing uh, Southwest has recovered to more than 80 percent of their previous passenger volume from pre-COVID, or at least flight volume, Air China is nearly 100%. Lufthansa, less than 30%. Companies, including major airlines and logistics specialists, that have needed to quickly adjust their plans and even reshape their entire business model, have come to realize that good data and the ability to interpret it thoroughly can make even the most uncertain situations less daunting. We've got um, Star Alliance, uh, which I think most folks know what the Star Alliance is. It's a it's a, a, a group of different aircraft carriers, um, but they use it for post-flight analytics, um, and they're using it uh, to really identify, you know, what's the safety performance of flights um, once the aircraft is on the runway. What's the impact that it has from that flight? So they're using our data to kind of assess that. Um, TAC index or TAC index, um, analyzing is, is sort of the air cargo capacity and demand. So they're looking at the flights and and, and kind of getting a sense of what's on those flights from a cargo perspective. Um, And are they actually maximizing what's available on those, those, uh, those flights? My air ops um, uses it for flight operations, um, crew scheduling automation. Um, And then you have some really interesting use cases. um, For instance, Satavia, which um, um, is one of our key customers, they use it for contrail forecasting, right? So they're really focusing on CO2 emissions and what's going on there. And they combine it with flight tracking and weather data as well to get a better sense of, you know, where can they avoid, um, uh, you know, contrails for, to, to, for the most part. There are, there are stories in every data set um, and there are insights in every data set. Um, and, and the key for every company is, you know, how do you derive the stories and, and the insights that can truly um, impact your business? Um, and that alone is, is a skill set. Well, the impact of COVID isn't a closed chapter yet. With ongoing travel restrictions, unequal rates of vaccination worldwide, and possible longer-term changes to work travel patterns, all creating an uncertain environment. I think we've seen an unprecedented impact on aviation uh, due to COVID. Um, Many of the airlines are now sustained on borrowed cash and government assistance. Um, The interesting bit is that it's not just the government subsidies, but it's also the macroeconomic trends. We're seeing extraordinary, putting my economist hat on, um, we've seen extraordinarily low interest rates due to quantitative easing. And it's starting to affect inflation. And uh, monetary policy says that when inflation ticks up, you adjust uh, with monetary policy. And so we might see interest rates going up. I know, you know, I'm here is the, the ADSB, right? Understanding real time pulse of, of, of uh, of aviation, but at the same time, you need to look at the real-time financials of aviation. And if you look at the macroeconomic trends of low interest rates, I think it's very possible that they will not be sustained for a very long time. And consequently, a lot of the choices that that airlines have made, a lot of the the choices that airlines have made are going to need to be revisited in the new financing environment. Unsurprisingly, the Spire team sees data analysis as a source of answers for some of the challenges that continue to disrupt our ability to move around the world as freely as we once did. You also have travel policies across the different countries that aren't necessarily consistent. If we were able to you know, solve the problem of developing a vaccine um, you know, within six months of, of COVID you know, starting, um, we can figure out a way of utilizing the data to ensure that uh, travel policies are eased and those restrictions are, are eased. Um, I mean, I know the IATA Travel Pass Initiative, which is something that Europe is looking at, um, uh, is, is hopefully something that they're going to they're gonna, you know, bring into the mix. Um, I would love to see them um, be able to take, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, Americans or anybody else who's gotten their um, their uh, their vaccine and, and build it into that system as well. Right now, I can go back uh, to Luxembourg, um, but I, there's no way for me to get my American vaccine into the system, right? And and I, and I feel like there's there's uh, you know some complex challenges, but if we're able to you know figure out a vaccine in six months, I, I'm pretty sure that we can solve some of these challenges that we're facing. But I absolutely believe that we can utilize the data, um, get a sense of who's vaccinated, um, understand how we can kind of bring that into a process uh, for getting people back on flights, getting traveling um, back up again. Thanks for watching this AIM video. Please like, subscribe, and share it if you've enjoyed it. 
Also, visit AINonline.com for all the latest on the aviation industry. 